Cook content. It's a thing every game deals with, and SCP Secret Laboratory is no exception. Hello, I am back. So sorry, hot goth women distracted me. Now, I love me some cook content, and I love me some SCPSL. And this game certainly has an interesting amount of content that has been removed slash never implemented into the game. And I thought it'd be fun to compile all of what I could find and confirm it to the video for your viewing pleasure. I've even had a whole conversation with the man himself, Hubert Muska, to confirm all of what's included in this video is true and give us some further insight. Now to be clear, when I say cut content, that either means content that is in the files but never used as well as content that has completely changed over time. Though, I will include content that was never implemented into the game, but did originally have plans to be included. So without wasting any more time, let's get right into this thing. The first part of removed content as mostly known is the original laser weapons that were part of the game. I'm sure most know what I'm talking about as the peak of Secret Labs on YouTube was with Kraken and Bed Bananas playing the game back in 2018. These laser weapons were known as Diffusion Weapons, which mainly belonged to the MTF spawning in. Those being the Fusion Rifle and the Fusion Pistol, as well as including the old Fusion Ammo type. Also, fun fact, the Epsilon 11 has had five different versions throughout SCPSL's lifespan. The idea of laser weapons, it dates back to the era of SCPSL being almost entirely an asset flip. And most of these came from a website called devassets.com. I'm a pretty proud self-taught programmer. And while generally we now resort to reading the official you know, documentation, I'm not ashamed of admitting that I used to follow online courses pretty much step by step in the early stages of development. And this pack from Dev Assets included models of physical bullets. And that probably means that the artist probably envisioned them to be used in more traditional sense, like, you know, like proper Kineda weapons firing real bullets, not laser weapons. But I have decided to embrace their sci-fi nature and turn them into laser guns, or more precisely fusion weapons, because the ammo they were using was called SFA, uh, the SCP fusion ammo, and the lore behind it was that the SCP Foundation developed this technology by refining gunpowder in 914. So that was, that was a lore reason behind weapons that, uh, well, got eventually scrapped. An interesting fact comes from the man himself, Hubert Musker. The fact being that there was originally planned for a sniper rifle to be in the game during the laser weapon stage. It would have been another fusion model from the sci-fi weapons pack to use for the models at the time. I think it came from the exact same pack, from the exact same artist, from the, from the same website. And I think it was the only weapon that wasn't implemented from that pack. Anyway, I don't believe SL is a place for a sniper rifle, so... The closest thing that you're ever gonna get is the revolver with a scope on it. I, I think that it was originally not included because of time constraints, because I didn't really feel like it. And yeah, realistically, I don't think that we really needed a sniper rifle at the time. We're fighting SCPs mostly, so we don't really need like one powerful shot from a weapon. It's almost always better to just use a weapon that fires automatically, even if it means you need a couple of shots to kill someone. Along with the old fusion models included three regular weapons. Those being the Scorpion SMG, the M1911 pistol, and the original Logicer. The SMG mainly used the facility guard once they were added, as the game originally had no facility guard role, and the M1911 being the original starting pistol like the COM-15 is now. And the original Logicer, which was replaced by this Logicer, which was replaced by this Logicer. This weapon came from a separate pack, uh, like not from the website, I believe it was a just a random package at the asset store. The pack was pretty low quality and <laughs> I'll just say the selection of weapons was questionable for uh, the purposes in the gameplay, but hey, it was free and I wanted more guns in the game and <laughs> there isn't really much to it. I just picked the first free weapon pack that more or less aligned with what other weapon types we wanted in the game. Right, let me just um, let me just get this out the way first then. I can't pronounce this. Alright, so Hubert's gonna do this. But spawning with MTF, this grenade was the original version of the frag grenade, if you can believe it, which would explode in a blue swoon. Similarly to fusion ammo, 
the whole positronic technology wasn't limited to just the grenades, but also it was the explanation behind Tesla gates and micro HID. I suppose it sounded cool, so that's why I decided to use the word positronic to describe anything electronic that just behaved differently in a non-traditional way. And real life positrons don't really behave any differently from electrons, they're just the anti-version of them. <laughs> they, they don't really have any special behaviors. I mean, they do if they interact with our versions of electrons, but the term positronic was effectively used as a catch-all phrase for anything that is electric and behaves weirdly. Before being able to simply drop ammo out of your inventory, originally you have to use an ammo meter, or later on in the game, a weapon tablet. This was used to see how much ammo you have and choose which ammo to drop. From the very beginning to this day, I am a strong supporter of limiting the number of UI elements on your HUD. But honestly, I can't tell you why we decided that ammo stats should be only accessible by equipping an item. It was the ammo meter at the beginning and then it turned into the weapons tablets. I think we can all agree that moving your ammo to the inventory screen was the right decision and looking back I can't really tell you why it wasn't like that from the beginning. Now I have to give a mention to my old beloved P90 and I'm sure a lot of you remember it as well. This was in the game up until 2021 and was mainly used by MTF Privates. <sighs> the P90 <laughs> or Project 90 was easily the most cursed gun in the first weapons rework. Specifically the way you reloaded it. At the time it was, I was like a gun noob and I had no shooting experience so what we just did, we, we did what looked cool and didn't really think much about it and now looking, looking back at it after getting, you know, a guns permit and spending many hours on shooting ranges I can easily say that this is probably the most cursed thing we've ever added. The magazine exchange system was, you know, it also means that the weapon was feeding from the front of the magazine, meaning that it was no longer a bullpup, and the casings ejected from the charging handle, and, and the charging handle itself was moving when the weapon was firing, so... Yeah, I, I don't think I want to talk about it anymore. <laughs> a not so known item that was removed was the smoke grenade. This was spawned in light containment armory, along with spawning in Chaos of Surgery inventory. Yes, the, the FPS killer. To give it a little backstory, I was never good with particle effects. The only way I knew how to make something somewhat opaque, like so you can't really see through it, it was to create like a 10,000 semi-transparent smoke particle effects that would overlay and hopefully, if the conditions were right, obscure your vision. <laughs> and the problem is that hardware really doesn't like thousands of small objects drifting on your screen, so it resulted in questionable performance, especially when every Chaos Insurgent spawned with it, so, you know, you could potentially have dozens of smoke clouds on the screen. So, smoke grenades may come back in the future, it's not really planned at this point, it's not exactly out of the question, but no real plans so far. For now we have SCP-244, which can be used as a smoke barrier, and I think that's all we really need for now. The cup was cup! That's basically it. Well, not really, as it was attached to another item that uh, Hubert will gladly talk to us about. But for now, the cup being a cup. 294, the SCP-294 was a very underdeveloped idea, and it didn't work 99% of the time. If you found a coin somewhere on the map, you could equip it and press E on the vending machine and it would steal your coin and usually that would be it, it wouldn't give you anything in return most of the time. It was supposed to give you a cup of random substance that would just, you know, give you a random positive or a negative effect, but it was never implemented and apparently if you were lucky enough you could indeed get the empty cup. It still wouldn't do anything, like I said it was bugged AF, but I believe in create game or if you were the first person on the server, it was supposed to give you a cup. This cup never did anything, uh, it wasn't really implemented, but the fact that it wasn't giving you even that empty cup was a bug that was never properly investigated, so in most of the cases it would just steal your coin and not do anything. Now throughout the years of SL there went a few different designs for the keycards. One of the more notable ones being Chaos's old green card, called the Breaking Card as well as recent removals of the private and containment engineer card. The breaking card is a 
Well, people assume that this is something that's supposed to break doors. I think there was even a joke re-implementation of breaking card that literally just broke doors upon pressing E on it. I think it was even proposed by the community to re-implement it like that, not realizing that it wasn't how it originally worked. Uh, the green key card worked exactly the same as the current Chaos Insurgency device, this little hacky thing. It's a mistranslation from Polish, which was karta Womu, which means something like break in card. So you can use that keycard to break into something, or that's pretty much uh, the reason it was called that way. It wasn't breaking anything, it was breaking into things, in this case, doors. So it was just a hacking device, a, hack a hacked keycard, uh, which eventually turned into a PCB version of it. As for containment engineer, this was something that made more sense when we had the recontainment procedures for level 3 SCPs, such as 106 or 079 and these keycards would open those chambers. Now that these chambers are no longer functional or they're accessible through with other conditions, this keycard has been removed, well, because it's no longer needed. All the doors that require that keycard are now removed or no longer require it. And as for private keycard, people complain about the problem with gates, the fact that they can't open gates. So we have decided to make like a universal keycard for privates and surgeons and, well, remove the private keycard. It's crazy to say, but since the memory update of 2022, SCP-106's FEMA breakables were removed from the game. Though, I'm sure people don't really mind that the insta-kill button is gone. FEMA breaker was removed in the 106 rework because we didn't really like how it affected the gameplay. It's definitely an interesting mechanic from containment breach perspective, like the original SCP containment breach game. <laughs> the only issue is, in SL, 106 is aware of the fact that someone was sacrificed and that there's only one button press uh, separating them from death, so it would result in 106 pretty much camping their room all the time, which was a big problem before the mimicry rework. We've decided to solve that problem by removing it. <laughs> That's pretty much it. Before Parabellum was released, players who wanted to cuff others would have to use an item called the Disarmor typically spawned within MTF units. The main reason this armor was introduced to the game was to give certain classes an ability to, well, disarm others. We didn't want to make it like a universal mechanic that everyone can use, so we had to tie it into some items. Now, as probably most of you are aware, we have it tied to weapons themselves, but Previously, we thought it was a nice idea to have, you know, an item that you can just find that would grant you the ability to disarm others. At the end of the day, it was another item that was just taking another slot in your inventory, so we've decided to move it to the weapons. I don't really have much interesting Shiva other than the fact that it was meant to be called Band Dispenser at the beginning, and it would physically create, like, elastic bands that wrap around your wrists and some form of, like, a single-use handcuffs, essentially. During the age of lasers, the micro also looked and behaved very differently. On top of that, there were multiple different versions of the micro's design in concept art. The old micro, once you pressed it, you couldn't stop it. And that also meant it was very easy to avoid it, because SCPs could just close the doors on you, and that would be it. The main inspiration for the rework was a very extrapolated mechanic of miniguns in games like Team Fortress 2, where you right-click to rev up the minigun and then left-click to shoot it. You can draw some parallels to how the current micro HID works. This is pretty much exactly the same mechanic. You hold right-click, but instead of punishing you with slower movement, we instead punish you with slowly decreasing charge. During the beta for Mimicry and Northwood would just update in the F1 menu, information for SCPs, you may have noticed a placeholder asset for SCP-2521 was used. This is due to it being a placeholder within the editor itself. SCP-2521 is nothing but a placeholder. It's not really something that we're planning on adding in the game, and even if you were, I'm, I'm not sure how mechanically it would work. Uh, it's a fun SCP to read. Uh, I like the concept of it, but again, not really something that we're planning on adding in the game. I believe it was chosen as a placeholder mostly because it already had the graphics uh, created for it, because it was on the wiki. The F1 menus have this little drawn avatars for each class, and SCP-2521 had already an image on the wiki that we could have taken without spending any of our own resources, and it roughly looked like the proper F1 pictures. 
so it allowed us to see how the F1 menu would look like without actually having to spend any time on working on our own images. Now, there's been a lot of misinformation surrounding this SCP, as Hubert gets rarely gaming mad about this. SCP-457 was actually just a copy of SCP-106 with a different name, but has technically made no appearance in official versions of the game. Oh, I, you were absolutely right. I do get upset when people bring this up as a scrapped feature. I can literally screen share, I have Unity open. I can go to here, I can, I don't know, search for SCP-106. I'm clicking on my keyboard, you can probably hear that. Press Control D to duplicate and change the roll ID to SCP-457 and there we go. We have just made as much progress as we have actually done back in the day when it was being implemented. This is nothing but a copy of SCP-106 with a different name. There was not a single ability implemented, not a single thing was changed. I believe the model was also duplicated and I added some stock fire effects to it, which I don't believe it was even looping properly or working properly, but that was pretty much as much progress as it was done. I can spend one minute in Unity and make twice as much progress as I have done back in the day. <laughs> in the alpha versions of SCPSL, SCP-079 could only interact with cameras. He also had a map of heavy containment zone on his screen. He could change cameras by clicking on dots on the map, and this was the only way to change cameras. He could also only look around heavy containment zone using WASD to turn the cameras. There were two versions of old 079 that were completely scrapped, and I'm not even including the pre-mimicry version. The very, very first version didn't go very far. <laughs> you couldn't really interact with anything, but there was a minimap. I believe I can find some of my oldest programming streams where I was struggling to generate a minimap quite unsuccessfully, and as a result of that, the project was scrapped. But later on, I decided to give it another try and created a very basic 079, which was really bad. People hated playing as it and it somehow didn't get removed before the release. You, you, you would have to navigate the cameras by physically clicking on them. Unless you were like a map expert, it was much easier to get lost. So you would constantly get lost as a computer, no idea where you are unless you were following someone. And instead of using auxiliary power as a way to limit abilities, you would instead hack a door by pressing on it and waiting for a few seconds, after which you could insert a command to either open or close it. Pretty much all you could do. So that version was later removed and 079 was not in the game until its proper reintroduction in Mega Patch 1, which was still very different from what we have today, but the core mechanics and, and concept remain unchanged. Okay, a quick shout out to the older versions of SCPs in the game before they got reworked. I'd go into more detail about them, but it's more the fact they had less features than our current reworked versions. And I'm sure you've all seen them in their time. So instead, I'm gonna give a little rundown of the older boys, and Hubert's gonna give some more insight. Old 096 was more hunched over when passive, and would only be aggravated when someone's cursor had looked exactly at his face for a few seconds. I think 096 was the first SCP introduced to SL after the release. It was not much different from the current 096. The biggest differences were that uh, you would need to look at his face for a few seconds in order to trigger his rage, and he was able to attack anybody for the entire duration of the rage, not just the people who looked at him. And other than that, I don't believe it was much different. Everything was just much simpler, with no Hume Shield, no extra abilities and so on. Old 173 used the beloved model we all know, and its speed would be determined on damage taken, as well as blinking being set at intervals rather than player controlled. There were a few differences with 173. The biggest visual one is obviously the model. I would like to disprove certain rumors that were going on that we were apparently being sued for using the old model, that that wasn't the case. We weren't forced to change that model. This is a choice that we have made out of the respect to the original artist and also to promote our own identity of the game. As far as I know, the original model is now removed from the official wiki and even they don't have an official version of 173, so that's all the more reasons to keep our existing version, even if we received a proper permission to use it and that would be the main change visually, mechanically. You weren't able to exactly pinpoint where you're going to teleport. You would just look in the direction, hold W, and if you wanted to kill someone, you would also need to hold left click. 
sometimes shift and that means that you would need to have like a key combo in order to try and kill someone, which was quite complicated and confusing to new players, but at the end of the day, it was much simpler. It's quite similar to mechanically to the current 173, except for like accessibility and all the extra features like breakneck speed and, and tantrum that simply didn't exist back then. The old 173 was getting faster the fewer health you had, and for a while the meta was to just take two hits on the Tesla gate to lower your health as, as much as possible, so you would get super fast and, and kill everyone before the first MTF wave. Old 939 had a simple biting attack and would be able to use proximity chat at all times. The best thing about old 939 was the fact there was two different instances of 939. I wonder why that was. So 939 has a very interesting backstory. There were two models, and the fun fact is that it wasn't planned. It was a result of a small miscommunication that resulted in two separate artists working on two separate models, and by the time one completed, the other was like 90% done, and we were like, well, I guess we have two models now. And I think there was some ideas to make them different mechanically, like one would be faster but have fewer health or whatever. I'm not sure if that's something that ever ended up being implemented in the public versions, but the the latest version of 939 before the before its rework, these two would be just diff completely have the same stats, just different models. And one thing that people always fail to notice is that actually it means that one was worse than the other, because one had a larger hitbox than the other. And this is a pretty underrated balance mechanic. Along with the old SCPs was the old chase music theme. This originally would trigger when you looked at oh an SCP, God. but since the memory update, it is no longer being used. Chase music, it simply wasn't re-implemented during mimicry. And honestly, it's as simple as that. We just never ended up re-implementing it. We didn't have any good reasons to remove it. We had plans to add different soundtracks for different SCPs. I mean, this is how 173 got its own soundtrack. For that reason, I guess we've used this as an excuse not to re-implement the old version, because again, Mimicry was a massive code rework. Pretty much anything that was related to anything class-related was a brand new code. I, I really wish we could give you a better explanation. I think it's going to make a return one day. My hat is Gucci, so is this bundle of 268. Yeah, that's it. I don't really have any specific comment here. We just made a second version and we preferred the second version. We had some issues with the first version that we decided to address in the second one. It's just as simple as that. Now we all know our true D-class jam, but sometime in development there were plans for other playable characters with models made for them. Those included characters called Kate, Charlotte, Claudia and Andy. We also had some planned backstory. Why don't I tell you about the backstory for our D-Class in the game. Jan is a 32 year old and originates from the Czech Republic. He was a former dealer of experimental drugs that were highly poisonous and is responsible for several hundred deaths. That's right, our goofy little D-Boy is a terrorist. And of course with unused class D models there were also unused character models for scientist and MTF which also included female variants. This also goes into the unused customization system that was in early versions of the game. Character customization is one of the things that sounds like a great idea but is an insanely difficult project to get right. Uh, while we may have some cosmetic variants in the future, the idea of having different subclasses with different trade-offs that people can choose in advance uh, simply results in an inevitable balance disaster. Like in the pre-release playtesting phase, it became pretty apparent that, you know, there would be only one meta character and pretty much everyone switched to it sooner or later. Kind of similar problem that we currently have with weapon lasers, the laser sights. It still is a game where you constantly are on the move and the weapon accuracy when moving is so great that players are either forced to use the laser sight or stand still and come the hallway, but I guess I'm digressing. But yeah, character customization sounds like a great idea. Maybe not so much in practice. Originally, there were female zombies, MTF zombies, and Chaos Insurgency zombies, but only the Class D male model is currently used. There were different models for different classes that would die. The main problem with implementation of that was that the game had pretty much no way of remembering what was your previous class and synchronizing it. Nowadays, it wouldn't be a big problem to implement that, 
but there isn't really a reason for that, especially since sooner or later we will be trying to replace all the characters. So we have decided to keep only one character, only one variant of, of the zombie, purely for the sake of making it easier for us to replace that model with our proper assets. In Discord, the image above will appear whenever a player who is playing SCPSL is a spectator. Its model was used as the ragdoll for when players died in very early versions of the game. The old ragdoll model, it kinda goes back to what I said previously. The game had no way of remembering what was your previous class, so it just dropped a generic ragdoll that fit all classes and that was shared between all SCPs, all humans. Even if you killed 079, if 079 died, there would be a ragdoll spawning on top of the PC for a long time before we moved the, the ragdoll spawn position below the PC. So when you kill them, the ragdoll would still spawn, but it would spawn beneath the PC and not over it, so it didn't look as goofy. Before the inventory we have now, originally it was a lot more similar to how the inventory UI was in SCP Containment Breach. Instead of a wheel, the inventory used to be a rectangle, and the information on items would appear just below the rectangle. I can't remember exactly what was the origin of that inventory, um, I can't remember how it looked in Garry's Mod Breach game mode. I think it was a simple Half-Life version, so you would just scroll and you would have those items appear on top. It was a little original, but very inspired by how Containment Breach did it. There were some changes, but to be completely honest, it's just a, you know, rectangle with a grid. So it, it, was, the, it was the simplest version of the inventory that we could have done, and that's why I have gone for it. Before mid, there was peak. SL had two other versions of the main menu, this one from early alpha versions of the game to the iconic projector screen. This one also had a version at one point where SCP-173's shadow was casted on a wall. We have a long history of menus. Some of them were more atmospheric, like I feel like the previous, the pre-rework menu, the, the one with the projector, it was clearly one of the most atmospheric me menus, maybe in pretty much all the games. I feel like we were getting it pretty well, we were pretty pretty high up in the ranking of games with a very atmospheric menu, but it was scrapped because of the menu not being very effective. Like, you could join server, that's great, but you couldn't really display any kind of settings. I still want this sort of menu, maybe one day, to return. I have a hope for it. It's not our plan. But this was this was pretty damn cool, and the, the main reason it got changed was because of practical limitations. The current menu is way more functional, it's less atmospheric, but you can see them all the settings, you can see, you know, the news, the, all, the server list is much more transparent and it supports more options. There are many reasons why the current main menu should be the default, but maybe one day if we'll figure out a way how to combine these two ideas and have a menu which is just as atmospheric, while also remaining functional. The Chaos and Certainty small vehicle used to be an M3A1 Scout car, and has since been changed to a smaller vehicle. This also goes back to the days of SL being pretty much entirely an asset flip. This is a model that was probably found on the asset store, maybe somewhere else on the internet. It got changed relatively quickly, I think it was one of the first updates after the release that changed that model into the current... Uh, I'm not even sure what was the current inspiration of the of the current Chaos car. I actually like the current Chaos model, it looks pretty interesting. It looks like a, like a cross between the Hammer H2 and, I don't know, like an SUV. SCP-096 had an unused attack animation where it would presumably grapple onto a human and smash that human repeatedly. It wasn't really a new ability, but it was rather an idea to add a cooldown on kill. So 096 would play this little animation when it's trying to like, you know, tear apart the bodies and or eat them or whatever the idea was behind it at the time. Uh, it would add a small cooldown on kill, so the 096 would be stuck in this short animation uh, after killing someone. But at the end of the day, we kind of want to reward 096 Rage as much as I <laughs> hated this SCP inherently. It still, it really sucks if you're kind of locked into your abilities during the very short phase where you can actually do something. SCP-106 had an unused death animation where it would turn into a statue. I think it's a result of a misinterpretation. It was just a technical demo of, you know, being able to have some 
other death animations. We later used that shader, I think it was the exact same shader to create the particle disruptor disruption animation when you die and evaporate. It's pretty much the same thing, but instead of overlaying a stone texture, you just overlay a, a, a transparent texture so you disappear. As the map of Seeker Labs was a lot of containment breach assets, a lot of the runes were removed from the game. The most notable ones being SCP-012's room in like containment and basically every room in the entrance zone, which included an older version of Intercom and the iconic cafeteria. If you want to see more of these removed rooms, take a look at this video I made of the map of Seeker Lab throughout the years. SCP Containment Breach is a game made for single player experience and it's no surprise that when we ported these rooms to SL, new problems have showed up, mainly the larger rooms. Some of them negatively interacted with the map generation system, like causing them to clip into each other. So there were the main reasons that halted further implementation of Containment Breach assets. As for the more recent removal of Containment Breach assets, such as the 012 room, the reasons are pretty self-explanatory. We slowly work on phasing out all Containment Breach assets and uh, well, we also needed a new room to store SCP-330, so we killed two birds with one stone, I guess. Sticking on change rooms like containment hallways were changed a lot. From the iconic containment breach hallways, to a familiar four-way section coloured green, and to the ones we have today. Honorable mention to the OG green room being two-sided. The light containment yellow accent was something that was developed by some of our very first room artists. artists Actually, one of these is still uh, working here for us, uh, Mora. I'm pretty sure many people heard of him because he is an absolute goat when it comes to making some of our most beautiful assets. I believe that was one of the very first models that he has done for us. Uh, at first, it was just we just put a yellow accent on it because it looked nice, and then many people accused us of copying SCP Unity because it also had a very similar style of rooms at the time. So we kind of panically changed it into more neutral, uh, I think originally it was red and then it was uh, black. And that's pretty much the only reason, we just didn't wanna, we just coincidentally come up with a similar layout to SCP Unity. And, well, <laughs> it was just a panic decision to make it less similar. In earlier versions of the game, there was an option on the main menu to play tutorial levels. These levels use the tutorial class to show the player how to play the game. The tutorial was originally removed due to maintenance problems. Unity Engine back in the day did not support what we call nested prefabs, which made it extremely difficult to keep the tutorial and the main game working at the same time. It literally felt like developing two different games. Nowadays, it's it probably wouldn't be much of a problem feasibility-wise, but I'm not sure if a dedicated single-player tutorial is the right move. In earlier versions of the game, a location known as range could be entered by using the command go to range. Players entering this location moved incredibly fast. If a player shot one of the three D-class, the damage done to them would be displayed in large green text on a far back wall. Shooting range was a debug command, it was actually a debug tool. Back in the day, I didn't even use Git for version control in Unity. I didn't use any sort of version control, so if my computer burned down, the whole project would go away. Which, looking back in the day, yeah, I can't really imagine working without Git anymore. But the reason I'm mentioning is that now I can just easily download two versions of the project, I can make a copy of it, I can keep them in sync, and on my own, I can just launch two instances of Unity, two projects, and I can connect to myself, to my own server, and test things. That wasn't the case back in the day, and the only way of testing if things are working correctly, such as the fall-off distance and, and so on, it was through shooting ranges, it was through making some simulated bots and testing it this way. Secret Labs was very close to having its first ever cosmetic in the game. If you went to TwitchCon in 2019 when Northwood was there, You'd have been given a code to get an exclusive purple scientist keycard with TwitchCon written on it. This was never implemented and is most likely scrapped. It's another example of underestimating the project size. Back in, I believe, 2018, we've been invited to TwitchCon, which was an event made by Twitch and Amazon, and we thought it was a great way to promote our game, so we've printed like Twitch keycards with little CD keys that could be used to redeem a skin, to the scientist keycard, a, like a purple variant of the keycard with a Twitch logo on it, a nice reminder of these simpler times. Well, we created a quick website where redeeming the code resulted in 
adding this Twitch keycard into your Steam inventory and everything until that point worked great, but everything else ended up being a complete nightmare. Because yes, you have your TwitchCon keycard in your Steam inventory, but making it so other people can see it means that we need some way of synchronizing your Steam inventory with other players. And I think you can appreciate how it's a relatively large undertaking for just one item. Another problem is, you know, large corporations like Amazon or Twitch are quite sensitive about their brand images, especially when they're being used on other products. So. We would be risking spending all this time on in-game implementation of the Twitch keycard while still taking the risk of them not allowing us to use their logo after all of that. There's an unused achievement called Roasted, which would be obtained by surviving a hit from a Tesla gate as an SCP. Presumably this was removed because that is the most easiest thing to do as an SCP. Norwood also changed the majority of the achievements in the game to be less toxic gameplay-wise. For example, Walk It Off was originally to simply die within the first minute of the round. Another one being Escape in under 3 minutes. It has now changed to simply being the first one to escape instead. Most of the achievements that we have removed were removed for a simple reason, and that's because they rewarded playing the game incorrectly. So whenever we had an achievement for, you know, blowing yourself up with your own grenade or falling down from like a railing or whatever or getting your neck snapped by 173 and so on we we've decided to limit the number of those because we don't want people to we don't want to encourage people for playing the game incorrectly we want the achievements to be an actual achievements not failures secret labs has two unused soundtracks that were meant to be implemented into the game the first one being we gotta run they're only not in the game but it's considered to be the mpf theme and the other being Forget About Your Fears. Used in earlier versions of the game, which was later replaced by Massive Labyrinth, it was played when a human character was the last alive representative of their team. The backstory behind pretty much all of our original soundtracks that are currently unused in the game is the fact that our audio artist just created a bunch of tracks and they weren't specifically designed for any uh, situation. They just created a bunch of tracks and, well, we simply didn't have enough uses for them. And that's as simple as that. Some of them have been assigned as a, as their potential purpose. For example, We Gotta Run is assigned to MTF, but to be completely honest, it could be reassigned somewhere else because it's never been officially used that way. Oh, and to close this video off, I suppose I can tell you that 079's nuke ability has been scrapped and is now cut content. SCP-079 rework for Mimicry started with a big brainstorm, after which we have talked about different features that we could get implemented for that SCP to make its gameplay more interesting. One of the ideas was the remote nuke detonation, which sounded like a great idea, and uh, until further in implementation, where we have kind of decided that there aren't many good reasons for 079 to activate the nuke, SCPs really are at a disadvantage uh, on the surface zone, at least on the current surface zone. In most cases, detonating the nuke would result in 079 being at a, at a disadvantage. It hasn't been implemented at the beginning for the time constraints, then we have re-implemented it uh, during PERS, and pretty much our theories have been confirmed. We haven't seen this nuke ret detonation being ever properly used to 079's advantage, it pretty much always resulted in, well, backfiring. And it's simply not a mechanic that we want to add, because again, why would you reward 079 with an ability that, again, 99% of the time would put you at a disadvantage? Well, there we have it. Everything either cut, removed, or never implemented content in Secret Laboratory. Let me know if you guys want to see any of these features make a return, and be sure to share this video to your friends, family, even your dog. That's all from me. I'll see you guys next time. Bye-bye.